John Steinhazen is the DA's new interim leader. ENCA political editor Vuyom Vogo is standing by to speak to Steinhazen about his role in the party. Pravi. Thank you very much and welcome uh, indeed. Uh, we are at uh, DA headquarters and with me is of course uh, the newly elected interim leader of uh, the Democratic Alliance, uh, John Stienhazen. John, thank you very much uh, for joining us well. You got what you asked for. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Well, thank you, Vuyo. Of course, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and that work has to start today. Uh, the DA has come through a really terrible time, the very uh, poor election result that took place. And of course the party's internal review process has revealed a lot of the weaknesses that uh, the party experienced. So we've got to set about immediately fixing those and then reconnecting with voters who lost trust with us in this last election, uh, connecting with voters who've never trusted us before and getting uh, the young people, hundreds of thousands of which didn't vote in this last election, excited again about politics as a means to altering their future. There is a steep climb ahead and I'm not, uh, I'm not for one minute saying it's going to be easy. There's a lot of work that's got to be done by this party and I'm looking forward to getting my head down and doing it. But I mean if uh, uh, social media conversations, you know, uh, letters that people write to newspapers, commentary that they make in both radio and television, uh, everyone seems to be saying that the, tr the gap you know, um, has actually widened between you and uh, the people you want to attract. Um, the departure of people like Musi Maimane um, has actually uh, suggested uh, that you are not prepared to take this party forward where people believe it should go. Well, I think that if one looks at the analysis and the, on, and the data, uh, it, a different picture emerges. In fact, we went backwards amongst black South Africans in this last election. Uh, the party advanced the most in those communities when it was clear and unambiguous un about what it stood for and what it was attempting to achieve under both Helen Zilla and Tony Leon. So I think that we can reconnect with those voters. What they want to see is a party that's solutions oriented, that's offering them a future in South Africa, lifting people out of poverty into opportunity, ensuring we have an equality of opportunity so we don't to engineer the quality of outcome, uh, making sure they've got children at schools where they actually have a good shot of a quality education, and of course creating jobs. Those are what, that's what interests people. I think that we get far too caught up in the, in the Twitter uh, sphere rather than actually dealing with the real lived experiences that many South Africans find themselves in, and they're desperate for jobs for employment and for opportunity. And I think if we can offer that, a compelling vision of hope and change, I think we'll be able to reconnect with far more voters than ever before. But pundits, analysts, um, look at it differently from the way uh, you are prepared uh, to look at it. Let's say there was a lot of scope under Tony Leon, under Helen Ziller, to actually harvest the white voter then progressively moved to the colored vote um, and those areas have almost reached saturation point. Now where you need to go next, where your growth actually is, is at penetrating um, the black vote mm -hmm. in uh, bigger numbers that you have been able to do at the moment. And your election as a white man uh, and leader of uh, the party on the back of Helen Ziller's um, election as the federal council chairperson uh, actually show that you are not prepared to go where you should be going. That if anything, you should have actually rallied behind Musi Maimani and made sure that where he falters, you actually put a great deal of support around him and actually keep him. Well, one of the biggest support mechanisms for Musi Maimani was myself. I certainly dedicated the last six years of my life to providing that support to make sure that he had a strong parliamentary presence, that the team in parliament was working well there. You can't rally around somebody who doesn't want to be part of the organization, and he's made a personal choice around that. Yes, I'm but, that is, but it was pushed. If, no, if, he if, wasn't if pushed. his comments last no, week had anything he to wasn't go by, pushed. he feels that he was pushed and it was a long time coming. I don't think that he was pushed. I think that he requested a review process in the party. He selected the three panelists himself. They were not foisted on him by That's because executive. he wanted to deal and with whatever shortcomings, uh, um, you know, 
that would have been uh, identified, but not to give anyone uh, a weapon to actually kick him out. Well, the report didn't say that he'd be kicked out. It merely says that we go to an early Congress. It never once said that Mr. Maimoni should step down immediately or move on. It said we must go to an early Congress. But well, the writing was on it the wall. It didn't he... say that he could not be a candidate at that Congress. He could have sought a fresh mandate. But they said because of the ideological uh, disputes that have been taking place within the party, it would be better for a leader to get a fresh mandate, particularly after the poor election result. It was his own choice to go when he did. Uh, and I, it's a choice I think it was the wrong choice. Uh, I think he should have stayed on. I think he should have fought on. Um, but you can't force somebody to do something they don't want to do. But the notion that this was a push out, I think, is an unfair analysis. This was a result of a report that he requested, uh, that he said must examine all aspects of the party. And as a leader, when the party goes backwards in an election, there has to be some uh, acceptance, and unfortunately, that buck stops with the leader. Now, if I happen to be elected as the federal leader uh, later next year, and we go backwards or have a bad result in the uh, local government elections, I too will have to take accountability and responsibility for that. That is what political leadership is, and it's not something unique to the DA. It happens in political parties the world over. The truth is, we went backwards in all communities, including black communities, in this last election. And it's right that we introspect. It's called accountability. And I think that it's important that that accountability exists in our own party if we're going to demand it of government. Now, you said at uh, your first media briefing today, after being elected as a federal um, leader, that you believe there's still a role for Musi Maimane. What kind of role are you talking well, about? Well, of course, I think Musi belongs in the DA. I think he is somebody who embodies uh, the vision of One South Africa for All. And I'm really sorry that he's left. Um, I think he could have stayed on. Even if he wasn't the leader, I think he could have stayed on, occupied a position on the benches. It's not... Uh, uh, unusual. Tony Leon went to the bench. Uh, other leaders have gone back to them. Colin Eglin did it twice. Uh, and to go and rebuild from there. I don't think that moving outside of established political parties and forming new parties is necessarily easy. Well, this is right to do so, but I think that the contribution that he could have made would have been far greater had he been uh, stayed on in, 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 within the DA. And I think the same goes for Herman Mashaba. Herman Mashaba is someone who clearly lives the values of the DA, uh, and he has done so where he's governed. And I, I think that, uh, that he belongs in the DA. And both of them are good South Africans. And I think th I'm not going to say that they're not a loss to the DA. Of course they're a loss to the DA. Anyone who leaves is a loss. And I think both of them could have had a bigger role to play in the party going forward. Do you intend speaking to him at all? Well, I would and like... And maybe talk, talk mm. options for him well, inside I would like, the party? I would like to, to, res uh, to speak with, with them and all other South Africans who have abandoned the Not saying him specifically? Yes, of course. I would like to speak to both But what of them. would you say to him? Well, I would say to both of them the points I've just made to you, that we are a better together. The party is better if it's able to bring more people together to build the core of a non-racial alternative to the ANC, and that both of them belong in the project. Uh, forming smaller parties is not easy. We've seen it uh, with COPE. We've seen it with the Independent Democrats. We've seen it with Good. It's not that easy. You go out to form a new party, you end up with two seats in Parliament. You get to speak every three days uh, for three minutes in a debate. Let's build something big and bold that's going to be able to really form the core of that alternative. And when the realignment uh, starts to take place in South African politics, as it no doubt will, that you've got the core of an alternative that's able to put the chips on the table and start to get South Africa onto a new trajectory of hope and prosperity. If he does indeed form a new party, um, notwithstanding the most obvious challenges mm -hmm. of setting up a new party, it also means you have, you're going to have a headache. Well, we've got a headache across the political spectrum. We've got uh, 13 political parties represented in Parliament. Uh, there are, were over, I think, 40 parties that contested the election. You know, one more is not going to make uh, any more of a headache than we have already on the electoral landscape. But I think the point to make is that we are still, despite the fact of the events of the last three weeks, we're still the official opposition in Parliament. We're still a party of government in the Western Cape. We're still a party in government in three metros and in countless other smaller municipalities. The work continues. Uh, we've got a job to do and we remain the single most viable vehicle in South Africa to form the core of the non-racial alternative to the ANC. But I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be as easy as all that because where you're supposed to have to be consolidating uh, potentially 
if uh, Musi Maimana's vehicle does indeed uh, uh, get kick-started. It is going to the first point, their first point of call is your own members. So you have people who are going to directly go or challenge you and try to woo people away um, from your party. And that's going to be double the headache that you're talking well, about now, which you're saying has been there all the time. I don't necessarily think that's the case. And I think, don't think you've seen a massive exodus of members on the back of, of Mr. Maimani's departure. And, but, you know, if he's going to form a new party and do a thing, he must do what he needs to do. It's not my job to focus on his party. It's my job to focus on the DA and to grow this party and to make sure we're battle-ready for the 2021 elections. He must get on with his business and his work. I've got a job that I've been elected to do today, and I want to get on and do it. South Africans have feelings, and black South Africans mm -hmm. in particular, that have hopes, they have aspirations. Mm -hmm. And they want to be able to, and DA members are no different, but they want to articulate their feelings, mm -hmm. their hopes and aspirations, very clearly, without being seen or, or that being, or someone insinuating uh, uh, that they want to retreat to a racial Lager, without uh, uh, being seen to be racist. Now, if uh, the impression many South Africans have is that of a party that wants to be led by white people, if it, if it is to succeed, then you're going to find it difficult to actually penetrate uh, uh, these communities. I don't agree at all. I think we've already attracted almost half a million black South Africans that believe in the DA already. And I think there's huge potential to grow there. But of course, what people need to understand is this is the best place for people to express their feelings in the core of a liberal democratic party because it looks at the feelings of individuals where everybody, no matter their background, their religion, their, their race, where they're, where they're from, is able to articulate their view. And that's why if you look at our federal executive, you look at our federal council, you look at our federal congress, you look at our, our uh, federal leadership, this is a diverse group of South Africans where any South African, regardless of their color, can look at it and see something of themselves represented in it. Yes, I am a white South African. Uh, it is a function of birth and it should end there. I've, I can only change uh, things that I've got ability to change. I can't change my skin color, but I can work hard every day to change the lived experience of the poor South Africans who are locked out of opportunity, who remain 25 years after the end of apartheid, still prisoners of exclusion uh, and inequality. I can work to change that. And I would like voters to judge me, not on the color of my skin, to see past that, but to see the ideas that I'm putting on the table, what we're doing to be able to drive a program to lift people out of poverty and get people into opportunity. And that's what I believe the core mission of the DA is, is to do precisely that. And it shouldn't matter the color of the leader. We've got councillors and mayors, we've got premiers, we've got activists across the country who all look different, who all speak differently, but who come together to form a, device, a diverse you know, uh, organization that's able to drive the mission of building the core of the non-racial alternative to the ANC in South Africa. And uh, it shouldn't matter what color the leader is to do that. But, but don't think about uh, you have to leave that. In other words, it's not what you are saying, which you have just well articulated, but how you actually put that vision, you know, uh, into mm. Practice. In other words, why can't or couldn't uh, a John Stian Hazen take a back seat and said, let's continue from where the path that we started by appointing Musi Maimane as our leader. And even if we do not believe that, uh, you know, uh, white people should not uh, 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 be, be precluded from leading the party. But... Even at a symbolic level, it's important to give South Africans that sense, you know, that we value black leadership. Of course we value black leadership. That's why if you look at eight of our nine provincial leaders are black South Africans. But I don't think anybody in South Africa, regardless of their skin color or their background, should have to stand back uh, and say, well, you know, I've got something to offer, but I'm going to stand back for... Uh, an accident of birth. I don't think that's right. I think if we go down that road, 
then we're back in the 1980s South Africa where people are being judged on the color of their skin and not on what they can bring to the table. That's not what the constitutional consensus agreed on. It said South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. And that diversity is what should be nurtured in South Africa. Now, I'm not saying it's not going to be an uphill battle. I concede the point. It's going to be difficult. But I think the more the DA sets out its own vision and its own stall in opposition to the ANC's policies, not going on how bad the ANC are, but how good things can be under the DA, I think we'll be able to win over more people in South Africa. I think things are so desperate in the country at the moment that people are crying out for jobs, for opportunity, for change, for housing, for safe communities, and for schools that can actually give their kids a decent shot. Those are what they want to hear from politicians. As I said uh, earlier today, it shouldn't matter what the color of the surgeon delivering the life-saving treatment is. It should be the, the treatment should be examined. And that's what's going to make the difference. That's how we're going to get the country moving forward again, by calling on the best of all surveys. Not asking South Africans to stand back, but asking South Africans to step up regardless of where they're from, regardless of their color, regardless of their background, to make their contribution to build this country. I think if we can get that right, I think the country would be uh, well on its way to getting out of the situation we're in and onto a new trajectory. So no more ANC bashing, but that, that, does the DA even know how not to do that? <laughs> well, Vuyi, it's something we're going to have to do. I think the muscle memory has far too often been attack, attack, attack the ANC. I think it's the politics that people are tired of, and I think it's a message that got sent to both the big parties in this last election, uh, who both lost, uh, lost votes. The ANC and the DA both lost votes. I think people are tired of the tit-for-tat and the point scoring. What they want to hear is solutions, and I think that the more future-focused, modern and progressive your party can be, offering a better tomorrow rather than trying to build a better yesterday, I think the more people we're going to be able to build and attract into the net. And I think that's also why young people are, 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 are not interested in politics. They don't like the, the you know, back, bashing backwards and forwards. New generational solutions are entered. They want to see how is this party going to make my life better and give me a better opportunity. And that's the ground I want the DA to play. But I want to say this. We still have a duty to hold the ANC accountable in Parliament, and we must continue to do that and where we're in opposition. But I think we can do it in a way that is constructive, future-focused, and progressive, rather than just simply criticizing for criticizing's sake, saying, yeah, we don't agree with you on this, but here's what we think you can do better to, to move it forward. But, but the question is how, because mm. if you say you're not longer going to bash the mm. ANC on the one hand, mm. and on the other hand you acknowledge that you've been this big blue jelly in the middle with no very clear uh, um, uh, direction. The question is the how. how. How are you going to do this? By being clear and unequivocal and unambiguous about what you're standing for and what you, you know, what, how you want to achieve that. That's why our policy Which is conference... What? Well, we want what, to, what is the differentiator? Well, the difference that we want to achieve for Africans, we, we believe that individuals are the touchstone of value in, in the country and that we want to adopt pro-poor policies that target poor people and lift them into, op into opportunity. That you do that by two functions, redress policies, land reform uh, and, and policies like that, but also that you've got to focus on opportunity policies because there's no substitute uh, that, to lift people out of poverty than a growing economy, well-functioning schools, quality health care for South Africans, and an economy that's growing and creating jobs. That's the best antidote to poverty and inequality. The wider uh, that gap is, the, I think the more race matters, the lower that gap is, the more opportunity, I think the less race is going to matter in South well, the government it believes, for example, that the NHI um, is the answer, is trying to redress. I mean, it's trying to redress um, and correct the wrongs of, of the past, and you remain opposed to it. We remain opposed to the government's version of NHI. We have put on the table our Cezani health care plan, which I think is a very good example of putting on the table a clear workable alternative. We believe there needs to be universal access to health care in South Africa, that it is not right, the state of hospitals and the raw deal that poor people have have uh, in the public health care system, but that the country and the ANC's conception of NHI is going to actually make the situation worse, not better. If one looks at the pilot projects that the NHI have done, they have not been a success. There are five key pillars that are required 
to ensure that you have a proper functioning healthcare system in South Africa. We don't have any of those pillars in there that will hold up a nationalized um, health system. And so we've got to look at more creative ways of doing it, but you start by making sure that we fix public health care. And it's not a function of money. We spend a huge amount of money on health care in South Africa. It's cleaning out the corruption and mismanagement at the public um, health care system, making it more efficient and effective, attracting private pee paying clients into public hospitals and restoring the confidence in the public health care system. And we can talk about NHI afterwards, but those key fundamentals are not in place here. Uh, but, but, the, I mean, but the problem of a health system that relies on underfunded and overcrowded hospitals where the majority of people go to was exposed. That was exposed long before we even uh, spoke of a state mm -hmm. capture. So those problems mm -hmm. were there long before there was the endemic uh, corruption that we speak sure. about at the state capture commission mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Yeah, well, sure, but you know, when you look at the big procurement, but let's look at the Kimberley Mental Health Hospital, for instance. You know, the project has been delayed for uh, almost a decade because of mismanagement in the public health care sector through uh, that type of uh, type of behaviour. So people are suffering because of that mismanagement. It's not something we can't fix. Taiwan has an excellent nationalised health system, but the experience there showed that. You know that, that you've got to get those five key pillars in place, and we don't have that yet. Uh, and it also doesn't lie in bashing private healthcare. What you should be looking to is look at creating private public partnerships within healthcare in the healthcare industry in South Africa, where you can bring private sector expertise into public hospitals. One thing private sector hospitals do is they know how to run an efficient, effective, a well-run hospital that actually heals people and provides a level of service. And I think we should be drawing on that expertise into the public health care uh, sector and looking at those partnerships to be able to ensure that people are getting a quality health care. Far too many of these of the incidents happen where people end up leaving public, the public health care system poor, uh, poorer and sicker than they were when they went into it. It shouldn't be right that somebody's got to take a day off work just to go and access medicines. There's got to be efficiencies that we can bring into the system. And we don't need to nationalize the health system to do it. Those are things we can focus on doing now, and I think that's why government's got it, the cart before the horse in this incident. We should be focusing on getting those basics right and then building on that as a basis for providing a universal health care access in South Africa. Now, um, uh, your last head of uh, policy disappeared. She clearly, uh, I mean, she stated the reasons how mm -hmm. she was undermined, underutilized, mm -hmm. and uh, the party didn't uh, put a great deal of focus and resources on the development of policy. And uh, the things you've just said about health now, uh, perhaps, if anything, actually a further uh, a proof, you know, that yeah. South Africans out there can't, don't really know yeah. what, what, what you are about and what mm -hmm. you uh, stand for. So how is John Cian Hazen um, going to take the lead sure. in not only articulating um, your policies, but making sure that broader South Africa actually understands or know, uh, people know exactly um, mm. where you stand. And I'm asking this because earlier when you were asked whether uh, uh, Ms. Nguenya, mm. you know, um, is going to come back or whether in fact that was discussed at the meeting mm. you held um, today, you said that that is going to be Helen Ziller's mm. baby. No, that's not what I said. The appointment is Helen Ziller's baby and, and her lane. That is the, uh, the Federal Council chairperson, the FedEx chairperson, is the umbilical cord between the professional operation and the political operation. So that procurement of staff and HR matters is dealt with uh, in liaison with her and with the professional operation. But I will certainly... But it's an important and very no, strategic... No, it is uh, an stra uh, important and strategic point, and I will make a contribution to it uh, when we have that discussion at the Federal Executive. But I do think, and I, what I am making a commitment to, is not only am I going to make sure that we are driving our policy message out there, but that we are developing policies that, are able, that speak to the very issues that matter to people. I think far too often what the DA has been very good at is lifting the bonnet of the car and explaining in graphic detail how the engine works. What we need to do is describe in more 
technicolor spectacular form the destination we want to get there get people to and how we're going to do it um, and uh, and in a language that people understand so you've got to make policies that are relevant but we've also got to be a party of big ideas again I think far too often we simply slipstream into a critique of ANC policies and so our policies are a reaction to something that the ANC is doing I think we need to be far more bold and brave to come up with new ideas and so I want the party to become a thinking organization again a party of big ideas a party that is discussing uh, alternatives and, and modern progressive alternatives for taking South Africa forward. And I want to champion that in the, in the party. I will be for participating fully in the appointment of a policy head. I'll be participating fully in the rollout of the process at branch, constituency, uh, regional and provincial level, and then the commissions that will take place leading up into the policy conference and into the policy conference itself. Because I think if we can get the party onto the same page around where we stand on issues, I think we're going to be able to go more. Get, we won't have that wobbly blue jelly because everybody in the party will know that we have policies that are rooted in our values and principles, which we can go into communities and share with people and show these are the policies that are going to get you a house, get you a job, make sure your children are being educated properly and deal with crime and criminality so that you don't have to live in fear on the streets of your country. And I think if we can do that, uh, there will be no more wobbly jelly. It will be clear, unambiguous, this is where we stand and this is what we stand for. Unambiguous and clear, yes, but I think uh, a lot of people would also um, like to see a person that they can identify with. Let me perhaps explain what I'm talking about. When you listen to Ms. Mwenya articulating the DA policies, a lot of black people don't speak the way she speaks. You know, they don't uh, share that kind of world view, certainly not in the way uh, she expresses it. And that's uh, one of those things that, you know, uh, sort of promote, <laughs> you know, that disconnect, you know, and make uh, uh, a lot of South Africans feel, but how can we identify with the Democratic Alliance when they can't speak our 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 language? You know, when uh, they don't seem to share the world view of the majority of people in this country, especially considering where we come from as a as a as a as a country. I would make this point in response to that. Uh, Ms. Nguyenio is just going to be responsible if she is appointed as the policy head, whoever the policy head is, for the formulation of the base document which will going out to the party. The people responsible for selling the policy on the doorsteps of South Africa will be our activists and our public reps and our branch leaders and our constituencies. It'll be them going speak to those... the way she speaks, for example. But exactly, but they shouldn't have to because it shouldn't matter whether you have a policy that wants to uplift people. It, it shouldn't matter whether you on the doorstep in Santon or in Kailicha, you should be able to have somebody on the doorstep from within that community. So I talk about organic authenticity from within that community who understands the needs of the community and shows that these are the problems in our community, but these are the policy offers that we have that are going to make your life better. Yes, you're living in a zinc and iron shack. You've been here in this informal settlement for three to four years. You've had promises made. There's been no delivery. This is how we're going to get you from here onto the housing opportunity ladder and to improve your life. And we've got to do it in a language that people understand, we've got to, in, a, in a way in which, and we've got to have that organic authenticity in that community, that the pe people that are going into the community are people known in that community. So you won't have Gwen and Gwenya, for instance, you know, knocking on that door. It'll be a local branch member who lives down the street from you or a constituency head who has been elected from that area and that's how you build that organic authenticity and there's no shortcut to that and I've been very clear to the party today there's no shortcuts no tick box exercise if we don't have activists and branches rooted in communities there's going to be a fundamental disconnect between people on the ground as you talk about who talk in different ways who speak different languages who live in different areas and this floating party the branches and the activists and the local people have to be the umbilical cord uh, that give the feedback and nourish those communities with the policies and programs that we have to change their lives so it shouldn't matter who the the head of policy is she's not or he's not going to be the one on the doorstep dealing with those policies what were the three top um, three things that you promised um, the people who elected you um, today? Okay. You had an opportunity sure. right at the start of the meeting mm -hmm. um, to sell your vision sure. um, to them. What's yeah. 
on top of your to-do to -do list as you begin this um, journey as well, we've got to learn from the from the past mistake and the mistakes, and I think the review report and the recommendations they need to be implemented, uh, so that we learn from the mistakes and are able to turn the setback into a comeback. I think that's that's key, and so it's going to be very important to do that. Secondly, to do what I've said, get out into communities. No more, you know, having branch meetings where it's a council and three family members, but actually getting into communities and then focusing on campaigns in those communities that matter to that community and using places like Parliament as a platform to make relevant there. I made the point to the caucus earlier this week that if you went out in the streets of South Africa and asked 10 people what a B triple R report is, I don't think one of them would be able to tell you. You go and speak to them about how we're going to fix uh, health care in the country, how we're going to make safer communities. That's what they want to hear. So we've got to use Parliament to drive those campaigns and lose legislatures there. And thirdly, I promised my dedication and energy from now until the policy conference and the, and the Congress next year and the election that I'm going to do everything I can to build this party, to regain lost ground, to rebuild trust with people who've lost trust, but also with people who've never trusted us, and to ignite interest again in South African politics and set the DA out as the clear alternative to the ANC in South Africa. John Stanley-Azam, best of luck and once Thank again, you. congratulations. Thank you, Boyer. That, of course, is uh, the DA's uh, interim leader elected uh, today here at uh, DA headquarters. And with that, it's back to you in the studio. Thank you very much. That was ENCA political editor, Vuyom Voko.